Chronic disease is crippling the world's people and the world's economies. According to the World Economic Forum, chronic disease will cost the world $47 trillion in both treatment costs and lost wages. Sadly, modern medicine has few answers for chronic illness. The good news is, lifestyle medicine can prevent and even reverse most of these serious problems. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob Rakowski. Welcome to this week's MoveNat Health Tip. So, what causes chronic disease? If you look at the World Health Organization website, they'll list the top three causes as number one, poor diet, number two, lack of exercise, and number three, cigarette smoking. The United States says the exact same thing. In the Journal of the American Medical Association, 2004, they published an article entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. So even though death certificates said that heart disease was number one, cancer number two, and stroke number three, this article said the number one cause of death here was cigarette smoking. Number two, they combined poor diet and lack of exercise. And number three, they said was excess alcohol intake. Clearly, these are things that we can modify in our lifestyle and behavior. When patients come to see me with chronic problems, I typically tell them that the cause of your problem is simple. You have not made enough healthy lifestyle choices to manifest the health that you deserve. I let them know to be healthy, you need to eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, and talk right every single day. Additionally, you have to recognize the power of self-love and the power of loving relationships. As is the focus with MoveNat, there's extreme power and health benefit to being connected to nature. Even though each of these factors is critical, this specific entry will deal on the focus of diet and nutrition. The others will be part of additional entries. One of my favorite publications is called the Copenhagen Consensus. Five Nobel Prize winners got together, along with eight of the world's leading economists. They tried to answer the question, what can we do to make the world a better place? They determined that combating mal malnutrition was the top priority. For every dollar spent on a nutrient, they estimated that this would yield a 17 to 1 return on investment. Now you might think that malnutrition is a third world problem, but that's not true. The U.S. has extreme problems with malnutrition. Ours is a different type. We have overconsumption, undernutrition. We eat too many foods with limited or no nutritional value. According to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, 93% of the U.S. population does not get the estimated amount of nutrients to keep the average person healthy. Malnutrition really has four areas that can contribute to its cause. Number one is actually problems with the soil. Number two, problems with the seed. Number three, growth conditions for plants and animals. And finally, number four is food processing. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, only 7% of the U.S. farmland is considered prime. What that means is there's a 93% probability that the plants that you eat were grown in deficient soil. Nutrition studies show that it takes 30 elements to create healthy plants, animals, and humans. But for the better part of the last century, the number one fertilizer in the world consisted of only three minerals, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It doesn't really matter where your bank account starts. If you pull out 30 units for every three that you put back in, eventually you're going to have a problem. And that's what we're seeing with the soil conditions today. Norman Borlaug won a Nobel Prize in 1970 for his creation of genetically modified wheat. It seemed that this was a really good idea. The crops had much higher yield and therefore they could feed more people with them. Well, by modifying the genetics of the plant, they changed the nature of the protein, they changed the nature of the starch. So wheat today raises blood sugar more than pure glucose alone. We also know that the incidence of celiac disease, a very severe autoimmune disease of the intestines, 
has increased by more than 400% since this genetic modification. Now wheat is not the only plant that's modified. The number one plant in the world is corn, and the U.S. leads the world in production of genetically modified corn. They've done some interesting animal feeding studies, and what they've found very simply is genetically modified corn cannot be considered a safe product. It damages mostly the kidney and the liver, but it also damages the heart, the adrenal glands, the spleen, and the blood vascular system. An incredible study published in Food Chemical Research and Toxicology, November 2012, showed some horrific pictures of animals that developed massive mammary tumors after being fed genetically modified foods for a lifetime. Again, the U.S. produces more of these genetically modified foods than anywhere else in the world. And if you buy processed food, anything in a package in a grocery store, there's a 70 to 80 percent probability that it will contain these genetically modified proteins, which we know are no longer safe. If we start talking about herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides, the U.S. uses over 600 million pounds of these chemicals every single year. An article in the journal Epidemiolo Epidemiology and Community Health in 2002 was entitled Persistent Toxic Chemicals in the U.S. Food Supply. They found out that the typical plant had at least five different chemical compounds in it. The Environmental Protection Agency has monitored human exposure to toxic chemicals since 1972. The five most toxic chemicals, the most common toxic chemicals, are found in 100% of the tissue samples. In fact, with fat biopsies, they estimate that every single person alive today has with, in their body at least 700 known contaminants. Another article that was published in Molecular Cell Endocrinology was entitled Endocrine Disruptors as Obesogens. What we know is that these pesticides and insecticides and herbicides have the ability to disrupt human hormone signaling. The most common hormones that are disrupted include insulin, which tends to increase body fat and diabetes, thyroid hormone, which controls metabolic rate and therefore leads to increased body fat, and finally, the sex steroids, which can relate or increase hormone-related cancers, like breast cancer and prostate cancer. When we look at animals, in 2009, 29 million pounds of antibiotics were used in livestock. This represents about 84% of the total antibiotic use. We now know that when these animals eat the antibiotics, some of it is passed directly to us through meat and milk, in fact, milk is allowed to contain residues of over 80 different antibiotics. But as these animals have essentially process these chemicals, they'll poop them out and the antibiotics get into the soil. Now we know that plants are actually taking up antibiotics from the soil. One of the articles I read that was really enlightening a few years ago was entitled The Healthiest Foods on the Planet. And here's a quote directly from the article. What you eat probably matters less than how much processing it's undergone. We know that processing food robs the plant of certain nutrients. I wrote the foreword to a book years ago called Herbal Virtues. And the first line of the foreword says, there's a synergy in nature that cannot be duplicated and cannot be isolated. This is true of all of our plants. Now, if we were to take a cup of whole wheat flour, it would typically have about 160 milligrams of magnesium. By the time we grind it down to white flour, it's down to 25 milligrams of this critical nutrient. That's an 84% reduction. Again, going back to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we know that the standard American diet is at least 51% processed foods. That means void of nutrients and often with genetically modified materials. And for some people, sadly, the diet may be as much as 100% of processed foods. So what can we do about this? Well, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2002 published an article entitled Vitamins for Chronic Disease Preventions in Adults. Now, they said there was basically three options to improve nutrition intake. Number one, physicians could counsel their patients to improve their diet. 
Number two, they could add vitamins to generally consumed foods. And finally, number three, individuals could take vitamins themselves. In later editions, we'll talk about how each of these strategies can work for us. But for now, I'd like to quote Jack LaLanne, who said very simply, If God made it, it's okay. If man made it, don't touch it. I'm Dr. Bob Rakowski, wishing you health, happiness, and success always. I look forward to seeing you again soon.